got to remember also Ford had their own program going initially with the GT40s mm -hmm. because uh, they had gone over to England and they had bought Broadley's Lola, Mark VI Lola, and to develop that into the GT40. So we were competing against Ford with their GT40 against the Daytona. The Daytona was actually faster and more reliable. The potential long term was better for the GT40 because of the very sophisticated chassis, lower front air, very, very good car, but it wasn't working at the beginning. Being as simple as this car was, it was easy to develop and it worked extremely well. So with that insurance that Ford had, again, Ford was beginning to win with a Ford Power, they decided that we would go ahead and go to Europe. So we made the decision. At that point, more chassis were ordered. The problem was that we were such a small team that we could not duplicate the cars in Venice the way we built the first car. So Carol called Alessandro Di Tommaso in Modena and says, can you find a carrozzeria over there to build the bodies for us? And he went to Carrozzeria Grand Sport and made the arrangements for us to build the next cars in Modena. So that was a real change in, in, uh, in, our, in our program because most of our guys were race mechanics, not fabricators all full time. So the next thing that we did uh, was we went to the Le Mans test day, uh, which is one before the race, a few weeks before the race. So it gives every team a chance to check out their cars because Le Mans is so different from every other course mm -hmm. that you have to go there and check everything out. So the big noise at that time was that the Ford Motor Company was going to come in with their GT40s that were being run by John Wire, who had been the team manager with Carroll when he won at Le Mans in 59 with Aston Martin. So they were good friends. And so they show up at Le Mans with two brand new GT40s, the very, very first time they'd run them. They'd just finished them up. They'd had a chance to run them at the airport in, in England. And they'd already had some aerodynamic problems with the car. And interestingly enough, you know, everybody asked, well, what do you think about this new car? It's going to really smoke the Daytona. I looked at it and I looked at the front end and I said, it's not going to work because it, the thing was so pointy in the front end, it was getting too much air underneath. Yeah. And they didn't understand aerodynamics at that time. Which is interesting, right? Because given how big you think of Ford and the amount of resources they probably had, they had that should have been a no-brainer. They had all the resources in the world, but they didn't understand how to build race cars. Right. I mean, it's just, it's very, very strange, you know, with all that stuff. Right. So I had said quietly, I don't think the car is going to work, you know. But everybody was impressed with all the PR that was going out, so the cars show up. So they had two very good drivers. <clears throat> they had Joe Schlesser, a Frenchman, because you always want to have a Frenchman on your team when you go to Le Mans. And of course, they had Carroll's co-driver uh, from Le Mans in 59. So uh, what happened on the first morning, they uh, put Joe Schlesser in the, in the GT40 and he went out. We were not running the Daytona at that time because all of our guys were down at the Targa Florio. They had not come up to Le Mans yet. So the car was basically sitting in the pits uh, with John Olson as our crew chief getting the car prepared. So Joe Schlesser goes out in the first GT40 and with aerodynamic stability and stability on the car, it crashes and is destroyed. Fortunately, uh, Joe was not hurt. And uh, so he's kind of dejected and he's wandering around the pits and he wanders over and he sees a Daytona sitting there. And, he, and of course he had met John down at the Tasman series and he says, what's going on with the car here? How come you're not running it? And he explained, well, our guys are down at the Targa. And he says, well, I'd, I'd like to drive the car. <laughs> and John says, well, I can't give you permission, but you know, you're qualified on it. Let's set you up on it. And as soon as Carol shows up, if it's okay with him, we'll let you run the car. So they set the seats up and set the belts up and everything for him and he got all set in the car. So the next morning Carol comes in and they explain to him, would it be okay if Joe tested the car? Sure, that'd be great because our guys weren't there. So at that time, uh, the second GT40 goes out and also crashes from aerodynamic instability. So now they've written off both the first two GT40s. Right. Now it's raining. Joe Schlesser gets in this car, never driven it before, breaks the lap record with it immediately. 
you know, really blows everybody away. Right. Comes back in and he says, I can even go faster. He says, I can even blow off the Ferrari prototypes, but it's not safe because we've got some rain here and the car is a little squirrely. Don't have any wing on the back end of it yet. So the best thing is to, we've got the lap record, we know the car works, leave it alone, because the next weekend it's got to go to Spa in Belgium. Mm -hmm. So that's what we did. So very successful weekend for us, very bad weekend for the GT40s. So the next weekend we go to Spa in Belgium and Carol has arranged for Phil Hill to drive the car. So Phil Hill gets in the car in Spa in Belgium and he immediately goes out and he's right on the lap record. But he says the car is so unstable that if he continues with it, he feels he's gonna crash it because going over the high speed where the car is unloading, the back end wants to come around on it. And he says it's really pretty evil to drive now. And at this point, is there anything on the back of the car Nothing on the back of the car, okay. so we've run to that point. So now Phil realizes that the car needs something on the back end. So he looks over at the competition, which is the GTO Ferraris who has a spoiler on the back end and says that must be why they're pretty stable on. So he takes a single little piece of aluminum that we had. I mean, we, the piece of aluminum is only about this big. It's not big enough to make a spoiler. So he cuts it apart into four pieces and puts screws into it, makes it long enough that we can put it on the back end of the car, bends the thing on the back so we can attach it. So it's like a piece of paper back there, simply on there. So to give it some strength in it, he takes two pieces of welding rod and puts it in the corner, puts a couple of holes in it, joggles in it, so that won't allow it to go down. Puts Phil on it, says, try that out. So they made this out overnight. You know, Phil's looking at the car, and he's got this screwy piece of aluminum on the back end. Goes out, comes back in after two laps, and the car is absolutely transformed. He says, I, says, I can't believe it. He says, the car is so much... He says, it's incredible. He says, now I've got so much downforce in the back end. He says, when I'm coming into La Source, he says, I'm locking the front wheels. Mm -hmm. He says, we've got to get some of the downforce off. So Phil goes over and he cuts, you know, one inch off the back of the spoiler. He says, try that. <laughs> well, Phil goes out two more, breaks the lap record again now. So we've had different drivers, different tracks. Everybody has broken the lap record. Comes back and he says, don't touch a thing. It's Perfect. Right. I mean, so you basically cut a Coke can became, down and made it your wing. At yeah. Point. So that <laughs> became the dimension which you see on the back end of the car. That's hysterical. <laughs> That's the way things were developed at that time. That's hysterical. I mean, it was just that crude and that fast. Yeah.